Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. Good afternoon, I'm Peter Cardwell in for Ian Collins and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Coming up, double by-election knockouts for the Tories as Labour celebrate victory in Kingswood and in Wellingborough. The Russian opposition politician Alexei Navalny, a vocal critic of Pre Pre President, President Vladimir Putin, dies in an Arctic Circle prison. And Prince Harry breaks his silence over the King's health in a sit-down interview with Good Morning America. And it's your call, of course. This show is all about your response and your opinions. We're asking this question. Can the Conservative Party recover from yet another by-election beating? Lines are open right now. 0344 499 1000. Text me on 87222. Tweet me at Talk TV. But first, let's get the news headlines with Jay Akbar. Good afternoon. UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron has declared Putin must be held accountable and that no one should doubt the dreadful nature of the Russian president's regime after reports that opposition politician Alexei Navalny has died while in prison. Lord Cameron's comments echoed those of Navalny's wife, Yulia, who at an international security conference called for the world to come together and fight against this horrific regime if news of her husband's death is true. One of Putin's most vocal critics, he has been in prison since 2021 on charges believed to be politically motivated. He fell ill after a walk and lost consciousness almost immediately, though his cause of death is yet to be established. That is according to the prison service where he was serving his 19-year sentence. He was moved to one of Russia's toughest prisons in the Arctic last year. Russian expert Kia Giles told Talk TV this news shouldn't come as much of a surprise. The cause of death is not established, and it probably never will be to anybody's satisfaction. When uh, opponents of Putin die, the chances of really understanding what actually happened to them are very, very slim indeed, just like with Wagner chief Igerny Prigozhin last year. But the one thing we can say is this should not have come as a surprise to anybody, including, of course, to Navalny himself, because Russia tried to kill him once, and then he chose to go back for more. Meanwhile, Prince Harry has revealed he's considering becoming a fully-fledged American. In an interview with Good Morning America while visiting a training camp for his upcoming Winter Invictus Games, the Duke of Sussex was asked about his father's health, saying he hopes the diagnosis will bring the family back together. Prince Harry added he was loving every single day living in the U.S. and says a U.S. citizenship has crossed his mind. It's, I, have, I have considered it, yeah. Yeah? yeah. What would... What would stop you from doing it? I have no idea. I, that's, I'm, I'm here standing next to this with these guys. Yeah. And the American citizenship is, <laughs> is, is, a, is a thought that has crossed my mind, but certainly not something that's a high priority for me right now. The Conservatives have been dealt a double blow, with Labour winning both by-elections in Wellingborough and Kingswood. The swing of 28.5% from the Tories to Labour in Northamptonshire is the largest in 30 years. Jen Kitchen took a 6,500 vote. In Kingswood in Gloucestershire, Damien Egan secured a majority of 2,500. Speaking after the count, he said he was looking forward to representing his constituents in Parliament. It means a huge amount to be able to represent and speak for. That's the important thing, to speak for the community that you're from. But there's a lot to fix and I'm just so grateful for people of Kingswood who put their trust in me. Well, speaking in the last hour, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says the circumstances surrounding the by-elections were particularly challenging. Well, mid-term by-elections are always difficult for incumbent governments and the circumstances of these by-elections were, of course, particularly challenging. Now, I think if you look at the results, very low turnout and it shows that we've got work to do to show people that we are delivering on their priorities and that's what I'm absolutely determined to do, but also shows that there isn't a huge amount of enthusiasm for the alternative. Elsewhere, two men have been arrested and six after six migrants were found in the back of a lorry at New Haven ferry port and taken to hospital. Sussex police says the freezer lorry arrived in East Sussex from France this morning. The Home Office has confirmed there have been no deaths. Retail sales have bounced back in January after a record fall in December. They were up 3.4% last month. That is the biggest monthly rise in almost three years. 
And finally, some good news for anyone struggling with the cost of living. Energy bills are set to fall by an average of 15%, saving the typical user around £290 a year. Cornwall Insight, who did the research, says it's because a mild winter led to high gas storage levels. That's it from me. Now with the weather, here's Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, we're going to see some mild conditions over the next few days, although not quite as mild as yesterday when we saw a high of 18.1. Now, of course, we saw some heavy rain overnight. That cleared away early on, and it's been an improving picture ever since. And indeed, through the afternoon, we'll see increasing numbers of sunny spells, but also a few scattered showers. These mostly for parts of Scotland, Northern England, some over Wales, but... In essence, some of those will spread their way eastwards as well. So temperatures in the low to mid-teens for southern parts of the country. We could see a 15 or a 16 somewhere, a little bit cooler over Scotland. And then things start to go downhill tonight as further cloud spreads in from the west. This will bring some fairly light and patchy rain, some drizzle uh, to western areas. Probably won't get across to the east. Uh, Saturday morning starting off again quite mild. Temperatures 8 or 9 degrees Celsius in the south. Just the chance of a frost over northern parts. And then through the course of the day that first rain area pushes its way northeastwards. It'll be followed by a second rain area. Now this one could be quite heavy. Uh, could see some intense downpours out of this. But again it's mild. Temperatures around 12 or 13 Celsius. That's 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you, Jay and Joe. Well, Labour has secured victory in two by-elections, taking Kingswood and Wellingborough from the Conservatives. Labour's national campaign coordinator, Pat McFadden, said the Conservatives cannot fix the country. These are fantastic results for Labour. I'm joining you here from Kingswood, where we overturned a Tory majority of over 11,000 last night. Uh, and the result in Wellingborough was even more spectacular. So... We are absolutely delighted. We've got two new uh, Labour MPs that will do a great job for the areas who elected them last night. And these are really important results in a general election year. They can't be dismissed as some kind of midterm blues for uh, the government. The election is soon. It could be as early as May, if not May, a little bit later in the year. This is close to the general election time. And so we're really pleased with the progress that we made last night. Well, joining us live from Kingsborough in South Gloucestershire is Talk TV correspondent Alex Barker. Alex, thanks for uh, joining us. Also is uh, Talk TV political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald. She's in Wellingborough. Well, uh, let's talk to uh, perhaps Alex first. Alex, really interesting one there in that a 11,220 Conservative majority in 2019 has been turned into a 2,501 majority for Labour. Tell us what happened overnight. Yeah, it's certainly a big win for Labour. As you say, they've overturned an 11,000 majority, and now it's Labour who has a majority of over 2,000 here, and a new MP by the name of Damien Egan. Of course, on the flip side, it was a blow for the Conservatives. They lost over 20% of the vote share. And there have been some experts today saying that perhaps the Reform UK party may have split the Conservative vote, and they certainly picked up a fair bit of support here and also in Wellingborough as well they came third in both of these by-elections they got over two and a half thousand votes here and actually if you combined the reform and the conservative votes you'd get more than Labour so that's a really interesting one to bear in mind and then the back the backdrop of all of this of course is the general election which is on its way later this year and the interesting thing about this constituency is it won't actually exist come that come that election. So it's being redistributed between three other constituencies. So we'll have to see how those votes get dispersed in that rejig. Uh, Alex, thank you. Uh, Alicia is in uh, South Gloucestershire. Uh, Alicia, very, very interesting in Wellingborough as well. 19.4% swing, although like Kingswood, a low turnout there. 
Yes, you're exactly right there. So the second biggest by-election swing to Labour uh, in history, coming second just after um, a by-election in 1994 when Tony Blair had just become leader of the Labour Party. And not just that, also the biggest collapse in Conservative votes uh, since World War II as well. They had 62% uh, of the vote share, and that's now gone down to 24%, so a really significant uh, lapse there in the Conservative vote, mainly due to those votes that have been sweet, uh, swept up by the Labour Party, but also also similarly in Kingswood to the Reform Party as well, who took 13% of the vote share. That's their highest uh, percentage of a vote that they've taken so far since the party came into existence. And we have to remember as well that this is a constituency that was not a Labour target seat whatsoever. I mean, if you'd asked people maybe a couple of years ago whether this would be a Labour seat, I think people would have found it highly unlikely. But today's by-election result, pretty comfortable win for Labour. Alessia, thank you, uh, and Alex as well. Well, joining me in the studio is uh, Jonathan Haslam. He is former director of communications for John Major. Uh, Jonathan, is this déjà vu all over again? Is the, does this feel like 1996-97 to you? Uh, very much so, in many respects, and good afternoon, Peter. So I'm not sure what Yogi Berra would have uh, made of these particular <laughs> circumstances, but uh, it is fascinating to see how history can potentially repeat itself. Uh, but we should have, um, I think, just a moment to reflect on where we are with the hype of these two important by-elections. Now, let's just say, how important were they? Uh, at Wellingborough, you could not see a Conservative uh, Member of Parliament or Cabinet Minister out there at any great strength supporting the local candidate. Yes, they weren't even, they weren't even really told to go, and you'll know within mm -hmm. politics you're, there's usually a grid drawn up saying which Cabinet Minister is going when. Yes, absolutely, and the whip's office to uh, all of the backbenchers as well, and the backbenchers don't say no because they know which way it's going to go for them. So you've got all of those aspects there. Kingswood also uh, didn't get an awful lot of attention the Tories wrote off both of these by-elections. They knew they were going to lose. And there's an interesting argument that says, actually, from Conservative HQ, it costs a couple of hundred grand to mm -hmm. put out a big team in each, and if you know you're going to get a shellacking, mm -hmm. do you go down there? Why I bother? think the answer is not. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect that we need to bear in mind. The other is the, the one you've already drawn out with the correspondence. Low turnout. Mm -hmm a lot of dissatisfaction. The overall trend of where we're going for the Conservatives is just uh, where we are, status quo. They're 17, 19, 20 points behind. And therefore, there'll be those on the right of the party who will be saying, hang on, look at what reform has done, as was pointed out in a previous interview. Could they have taken all that away and we could have won? Um, therefore, Rishi, please get... Mm. More tax cuts, immigration. Well, Jacob Rees-Mogg is already this. saying that he's part of the Popular Conservatives, yep. of course. But even the New Conservatives, another one of these groupings, Miriam Cates and Danny Kruger, saying things have to change. Yes. I, I mean, I think that Rishi Sunak's position is secure until the election. I think they'd be mad to change that. But really, there isn't a lot of enthusiasm for him as leader at the moment. Is this just terminal decline? Is there anything that can be done? Uh, there is a mountain that the Conservatives have to climb. Uh, my view is that actually as we come closer to the election, and, and I'm putting by £5 worth, not the 1000 that you know Rishi picks up day by day, my £5 is on October and November. I mm -hmm. think that's when mm -hmm. they'll go. The economy may have improved, and you'll be able to ask that question, do you feel a bit better yes. now than you did before? So there's still a lot to play for, and I think things will tighten considerably. And let's not forget, Labour does still have an awful long way to go to claim Although, back I mean, what it lost before. You're talking, though, about perhaps the polls tightening there, and I think that probably, I agree with you, I think that probably will happen. But at the same time, Labour have been consistently ahead for over two years. The Conservatives haven't been ahead in a single poll, any published uh, poll for over two years. I mean, this is just, we're just on the glide path to a Labour victory, aren't we? I believe that we probably are. The question for Sunak and the sensible part of the Conservative Party is this. Do you look for a Armageddon, a wipeout, and then you get taken over by uh, the extreme right, probably supported by reform, because I haven't spoken much about them at the moment, but it's, they're kind of important. Or do you ameliorate things and then allow a sensible centre party still to exist within the Conservative Party? And Sunak's job, I think, if you are asking him now, would be, all right, it may be tough, but let's not give up, let's hold on to the centre, that's where the ground is won, and we'll stick with it. And if we're looking at the right, 
forget it, because not every Conservative voter who didn't in the past, did not vote today, went off to reform. Mm -hmm. So that's not known at the moment. It can be overstated. Yes. And the other thing I think we could both say, Peter, with a degree of certainty, is that Nigel Farage is going to keep teasing us Mm -hmm. generally and uh, at a local level in whichever Essex constituency he's thinking about standing in until the last possible moment just to keep the pressure on. Yes. But we're in for a volatile period, that's yeah. absolutely the case. It's interesting actually talking about uh, reform because in Wellingborough, Ben Habib, who's the deputy leader, came third and this is what he had to say about the electoral force that is Reform UK, which uh, has done pretty well actually in both these elections. Three months ago, we polled 5% in Tamworth and slightly less than that in Mid Bedfordshire. And everyone was criticising reform for not really living up to its polling expectations. Well, yesterday, my colleague Rupert Lowe met our national polling figures in Kingswood, and I beat them by 30% in Wellingborough. So, Reform UK has gone from 5% to 13% in three months. That's a massive step forward. Electorally, we're going to keep growing, we're going to build on this base. Remember, we're only three years old, you know, and the, I think by the time the general election comes, we're going to be firmly embedded in the electorate psyche as a genuine alternative party for which to vote. I mean, Ben Habib says that Reform UK are only three years old. Technically, he's correct, but of course they emerged from the Brexit party, which didn't stand in the vast majority of constituencies in 2019. But if you look at Wellingborough uh, last night, 13% is what Ben Habib got, and Kingswood, Rupert Lowe got 10%. Uh, many more votes than the Liberal Democrats in both those constituencies, but also in the national picture in terms of what the polls are saying, Reform UK are, could well be the third party, at least in terms of a percentage of votes, but that probably won't translate into seats. Oh, I think that, that, that that's fantasy politics, when people talk about that. I think that you will find that over time, the, uh, the, particularly when you come to the general election, that vote will disappear. You think so? Because I think it's more a case of people who are approached in the street saying, I'll go for reform, because they so want to give the other vote or? or a protest vote, uh, and is it translated? And I don't think it is. I think that they will move away. I think perhaps an easier one for quite a large percentage there is to say, actually, we're kind of don't knows. Mm. Can we stomach another vote? Because there are 20 percent of people in polls who say they are in, in a don't know, and yeah, also very much how, so. how secure. I suppose we're going to talk to a pollster a little bit on a little bit later on in the programme mm. in terms of how solid those votes are. Mm. I actually want to ask you about something else, which is the big story of the week until these by-elections politically, which is anti semitism now, um, Damien Egan, who is the new MP elected last night for Kingswood, said this just didn't come up on the doorsteps. Do you think Labour can draw a line over the, under, I should say, the uh, huge controversy in uh, the north of England, Rochdale, where there is a by-election in just less than two weeks now? Uh, these by-elections have actually been a godsend for Keir Starmer because they do give a different sense of what's going on. And I don't think, actually, that people have forgotten about what's happening in Rochdale. There will be concerns about how far the Labour Party has been able to eradicate anti-Semitism. And there are questions, again, about Keir Starmer's judgment. And I say that because, although he says he took decisive action... and It was not decisive. It, absolutely. You, you can't, under these circumstances, and I understand the dynamic that he faced, there's a lot of people saying, well, we couldn't just leave the door open for uh, George Galloway. That, that is inflammatory. The fact is, Starmer has done an incredible amount to get rid of anti-Semitism, yeah. and when it resurgence, if there's a resurgence of it, I think he's got no other choice than to say, we just cannot accept it. And the chances are, in any case of grown-up politics, you expect something else to come out. Mm. And that is going to capture the moment, and it sets a tenor, which Starmer has worked really hard to get rid of, mm -hmm. and in those circumstances, it's no risks Yes, it's hard. Yes, mm. it's tough. No, we don't have a candidate. That's it. Yeah. Uh, and we improve. But you have to do it first time. Second time round, he was given yeah. a bit of grace. Well, actually, you're the, you're the expert in this because mm. you ran communications in Downing Street for a, a number of years, for six years. It, it's interesting, actually, in terms of how this looks, because I used to work in politics and we always used to say perception is reality. Uh, yeah. People uh, feel as it, in terms of what they see and what they feel. So, in terms of how Keir Starmer handled that, I mean, they were probably always going to win Kingswood and Wellingborough. I've been saying that all week. But actually, does this have a... a I mean, Rochdale's in two weeks' time. 
it'll be really interesting to see what happens there. But I wonder, from his handling, you know, having been in Downing Street, you've got to make decisions really quickly on very difficult, uh, I, very difficult subjects. When they get to that level, it's usually 51-49 in terms of how the decision can go. Is Keir Starmer someone who can make difficult decisions quickly and the right decisions? He should have acted quicker in these circumstances. I mean, that is just political reality. I'll give you, if I may, one example. Lower down the scale, but there was a junior minister in John Major's government towards the end of that government who had said some disparaging remarks about Europe and actually was on the edge. Now, from the time it took us, uh, with a political secretary, the Prime Minister, myself and one or two other people, to walk from the door of the Cabinet Room to the front door of Downing Street that man was fired. That's decision wow. taking okay. on uh, in a real speed. And the problem that Keir Starmer's got is that he's a little bit in some respects like Barack Obama. He wants to analyse everything to mm. death. Mm. Sometimes you need that political antennae and that gut feel that just yeah. says, you've got to do this. Because you can't you have, have all the facts all you, the time. You yeah, have absolutely. to back yourself for your gut judgment. Yeah. And that's where Rishi Sunak misses out, I think, mm. Peter, in a number of respects. He's a bit like Mario Draghi. He's a technocrat. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not had long in Parliament as a member of Parliament, as a minister, as a prime minister, to get the rough skin to understand how people in Parliament work and to have a better understanding yeah. of how the people outside well, London Bridge, where we are today, yeah, are absolutely. thinking about their futures and, and what they're doing day by day. I think that's a very good point, Jonathan. I agree. Jo I don't think Rishi Sunak understands his own party, never mind people. But that's a discussion for another day. Well, coming up after the break, what do these by-elections tell us about ahead of the general election? Later this year, we'll be talking to a pollster. I'm Peter Cardwell, sitting in for Ian Collins, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever, I think it's a nonsense. <laughs> King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and bagged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. that for? This is Plank of the Week, <laughs> Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is, Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it Unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the new conservatives, the ERG, the common sense research group, the red wall, red trouser, popcorn. I mean, popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, <laughs> in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as, long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And yeah. that's because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that can't be right, can yeah. it? Yeah. 
Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Well, the Conservatives have suffered a significant setback. Labour emerging victorious in both Wellingborough and the Kingswood by-elections. Labour's impressive 28.5% swing from the Tories in Northamptonshire marks the largest in three decades, with Jen Kitchen, now an MP, securing 6,500 votes. In Kingswood and Gloucestershire, uh, Damien Egan clinched victory with 2,500 vote majority. Reform UK were third place in both constituencies and John McTarnan, he's a former advisor to Tony Blair, said on Talk Today, our breakfast programme, that the electorate's, electorate's verdict is clear. We've seen the settled will of the British people is to get shot of the Conservative government. Uh, we, they want a national moment of exorcism. That's what the general election is going to be. It will be getting rid of the Conservatives. And the Labour Party has to be, has to be step out of the way. Don't get between the voters and the object of their wrath. Exorcism, my goodness. Well, the Conservatives attributed their humiliating defeats in Kingswood and Wellingborough to low voter turnout. 37% at one, 38 in another, as the Prime Minister described these by-elections as particularly challenging during a speech in Essex this morning. Midterm by-elections are always difficult for incumbent governments and the circumstances of these by-elections were, of course, particularly challenging. Now, I think if you look at the results, very low turnout, and it shows that we've got work to do to show people that we are delivering on their priorities, and that's what I'm absolutely determined to do, but also shows that there isn't a huge amount of enthusiasm for the alternative in Keir Starmer and the Labour Party, and that's because they don't have a plan. And if you don't have a plan, you can't deliver real change. And when the general election comes, that's the message I'll be making to the country. Rishi Sunak says his plan is working. Is it? We'll be taking your calls in a moment, so do give me a call, 0344 499 1000. You can text or tweet as well, and on Twitter, actually, Dead as a Dodo has been in touch. He says, I won't be voting Conservative unless Rishi Sunak takes the party to the right. I'm not interested in being Lib Dem or Con Socialist. Well, joining me now to unpick these by-election results is King of Polls, Joe Twyman of Delta Pool. So thank you very much for joining me, Joe. Um, there's, there's lots that people look into by elections. People add the Conservatives and Reform together and say that that would be more than the Labour vote. People say this is an incredible, amazing victory for Labour, and we do have to give them credit. They've won two by elections. But how much does this actually relate both to the 2019 by elections and what might come ahead in perhaps October, November, when the 2024 general election happens, Joe? Well, you have to be really careful about reading too much into by-elections because they are always unusual. There are specific local factors that can have an impact and, of course, all the concentration is on these two constituencies rather than the entire country, as you would get at a general election. And it is true that turnout tends to be lower in these, uh, in these elections than you would expect at a general election. But having said that, what these results demonstrate, and they demonstrate it very clearly, is that the national picture we've been seeing in the polls now for not just for months but for years of a strong Labour lead is replicated in these results. If you take this week's polls and you replicate what that would look like at a general election, if there were a general election tomorrow, you would expect Labour to win in both Kingswood and Wellingborough. And that's exactly what happened. And yes, in Wellingborough the swing was absolutely enormous by historical standards, but that's probably linked to the unusual local factors in that constituency. It doesn't change the fact that Labour are where they need to be and also where the polls suggest they should be. Of course, there's not a general election tomorrow. We have many months, we assume, until the election takes place and things could change. But certainly, off the back of the news of a recession this week, it's not good news for Rishi Sunak. It is a bad week for Rishi Sunak. We had inflation holding at 4%. Uh, it was perhaps going to go up, some economists said. Guess what? They were wrong. We're in recession and two by-election defeats. But you're right, Joe, in terms of this being just another bit of evidence, not definitive evidence, but another bit of evidence put with those poll leads. Am I right in saying that the Conservatives haven't been ahead in a single poll in two years? Uh, well, actually, longer than that. The Conservatives have not been ahead in any published poll since the 6th of December 2021. And Labour have had a double-digit lead in 
every published opinion poll since the 26th of September 2022. So these long-term trends are extremely long and, at least so far, have proved to be ex extremely consistent. Rishi Sunak's message is that the plan is working. I mean, it's not, is it? Uh, whatever plan he has, the five uh, bits of the five key pledges that he had, only really one of them has, has come true in terms of inflation being uh, more than halved. And also people, presumably, in the polls that you put out, don't really feel grateful to Rishi Sunak for inflation, you know, prices going up, just not as much as they were a while ago. What, what sort of impact do you think not only this bit of evidence with the by-elections, but if there are polls coming out, Britain in recession, so on, perhaps at the weekend. What can we expect to see then, do you think? Well, I think it's only fair to say the plan is working if your plan is to leave Downing Street in the autumn, in which case he's playing an absolute blinder. But assuming it is more complicated than that, and, uh, and instead he, uh, Rishi Sunak wants to focus on these five pledges, he has a long way to go. When we polled the public on how many pledges they thought the government had actually met, we found that only around... Uh, sorry, we found that the mean number, the average number that people thought had been met was just one, and that one was particularly around the legislation being introduced to, snop, uh, to stop small boats. There's, of course, a discussion about whether that will actually stop boats or not, but at least he has managed to introduce the legislation. When it comes to the economic indicators, so growth, uh, reducing inflation, the public don't believe that he has achieved his promise on that, and that's a real problem. Just because when you, you look at the... Sorry, when you look at sorry the to interrupt you. Just, I just want to ask you very, very briefly about reform, because they came third in both constituencies. 10% in Kingswood, 13% in Wellingborough. Are they now an electoral force to be reckoned with? Uh, well, it depends how you define an electoral force. I don't think they're still in a position where they could win in any constituency, but they have grown noticeably since their previous by-election uh, performances and, again, much like Labour, are now broadly in line with what the national polling suggests. And so that could certainly cause damage to the Conservatives from the right of the political spectrum as Labour causes them damage from the left. And that pincer movement could spell disaster come the election in what we assume will now be the autumn. OK, uh, Joe, thank you very, very much indeed. That's Joe Twyman there, King of Polls, who is uh, from the Delta Poll. He's the founder there. Well, let's speak now to you at home. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. And Jill in Cornwall has given me a ring about the by-elections. Uh, Jill, what do you think? Well, for a start, I've never been asked to take part in a poll ever, and I don't know of anyone anyone that has actually sort of taken part in a poll either. And, and to be perfectly honest, I think that a lot of Conservative voters, maybe a lot of Labour Party voters as well, but a lot of Conservative voters won't bother with these by-elections. They won't bother to go out and vote. We, we and do have, you're absolutely right, uh, Jill, we've turned out of 37% in Kingswood, 38% yeah. in Wellingborough, but e mm. even, if, even if you have a larger turnout, it doesn't seem to be better for Rishi Sunak. It seems the Conservatives are under a huge amount of pressure and that Labour will be the next government of this country. Well, that is how it might appear according to the polls as they've gone and the elections as they've gone. But you may find that when the actual election t for the country turns up, that um, it won't be as these pollsters are actually pro proclaiming. It's a bit like... Um, uh, the Leave campaign, you know, the um, the, the Remain in the uh, campaign that was done, they, they sort of were so shocked when the actual vote took place and found that um, 17 million people voted to leave. But, but Jill, no, Jill I, I totally get your point on the Leave campaign, and they played a blinder getting that across the line, the Democratic vote to leave the uh, EU. But every yeah. bit of evidence, forget the polls for a second, although I think we disagree on that, but let's put that aside for a second. Every bit of evidence of every by-election we have, apart from one, over the course mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of this parliament, is a loss for the Conservative Party. I mean, you can talk about exceptional yeah. circumstances, you can talk about yeah. different factors, but, but really the evidence is there, is it not, Jill? Well, we're in this situation where I, I, at the moment, don't. I would not vote for Labour, but I wouldn't vote for the Conservatives either. I really am so 
dissatisfied with every politician that has stood up and said what they want to do. Because when push comes to shove, they do nothing of what they say they want to do. And that goes for the Labour Party politicians as well as the Conservatives. So at the moment, I would not want to vote for either one of them. But when when actually on the day, mm. we have to vote in order to select... Uh, do, you, do you think you might hold your nose and vote Conservative on, on the day, Jill? Well, I think I would have to in order to stop Labour from getting in because there are so many things about the Labour Party that I'm unhappy with. Yeah. Uh, I, I, the fact that they might get in is a worry for me because of their views on certain things that I feel very strongly yeah. about. Well, Jill, it's, it'll be really interesting just to see how many people are undecided at the moment but on the day sort of perhaps vote for the, the party, whichever party it is that they voted for otherwise. Um, Terry is in Dover and has given me a call, 0344 499 1000. Terry, what do you make of a dramatic political week and especially the by-elections in the last couple of days? Um, well, you had Peter Bowen who was disgraced and, and the chap in Kingswood, he was the one who resigned because of the... Um, Net zero thing, wasn't he? Yeah, he didn't like what the UK yeah, government yeah. was doing on, on, on environmental things, so he, he resigned. Yeah, he actually right. became yeah, an independent. Yeah, yeah. Peter, Peter Bone, I should somebody. say, denies the allegations against him. But, yeah, um, but, you, you, but Terry, it's interesting what's happened, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the swings are massive. But, but I think, Peter, um, you know, we've got nearly a year to go before the general election. And, um, you know, as, as Jill said before, um, I think... Many people will go into the polling booth and, and think, well, Labour could well be worse here. Um, I mean, as far as the Conservatives go into the right, you know, they'll be wiped out, you know. Um, but they've got to go on their One Nation Conservatives. They've got to appeal to young people, Peter. Can they, can they do that, though? Can they? I mean, uh, there's such a short period of time yeah, I know. to be able to do that, Terry. It's, it's very, very difficult, isn't it? Um, but, I mean... Most young people these days, as you know, Peter, they're voting socialist or anti-capitalist. So that means Labour. They've got to try and do something on housing for them. Um, they've had 14 got... years, Terry, some people yeah, would know. say. You know. <laughs> I know. You know why, why, I mean, it's interesting you mention that, though, because Michael Gove actually was talking about that earlier this week. He had three days of announcements on housing saying that we need to connect exactly what you're saying there, connecting young people with capitalism. But to me, anyway, it just seems that that's a fine idea. But, I mean, Michael Gove's been in politics in this country for, you know, the last 20 years. Yeah, There's so much more I, that could have been done. I know, Peter. I know it's difficult. But, I mean, as a floating voter, I mean, you know, I was around in the 70s, and, and, and um, we can all trot out this thing about Liam Byrne, you know, with Gordon Brown saying there's no money There's left. no money left, yeah. Yeah, and all the rest of it. I think the thing is, Peter, um, if people are undecided, you know, there was a low turnout in, in, the, in, in these ones, they might just say, you know, um, on, 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 well, West Streeting is pretty good on the health service, I'll give him credit for that. But, but on the boats and, and the economy, if they do reduce tax and, 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 and make it, you know, uh, less of a, um, an economic crisis for people come the next election, they, they can improve. I think there's a chance for them, actually, Peter, to be honest with you. That's interesting, Terry. There are a lot of thoughts going around your head, though, in terms of what is, you know, how you're, how you're going to vote and so on. I mean, it'll be, it'll be really, really interesting to see what happens. Terry, thank you. Paul in Chelmsford has given me a call as well, 0344 499 1000. Paul, what would you like to say? You're very welcome to the programme this afternoon. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I mean, uh, the Conservative excuse that it was a, a low voter turnout uh, I, I can understand that. The reason why it was a low voter turnout is because people are sitting at home trying to get a hospital appointment, yeah. a doctor's appointment, a dentist appointment, a mental health assessment mm -hmm. from somewhere. Uh, so they, they really can't go out and vote. And that's a I really mean, good point, Paul. And I wonder if you think, as, as many people think, who call my shows I'm on at the weekend between 10 and 1 Saturday and Sunday, um, who, who often say, actually, we're not sure voting is going to make that much of a difference because whoever the, pol the politicians are, we feel they'll let us down. And those public services who are paying a heck of a lot of taxes for, whether it is all those things you mentioned there, the dentist appointment, the doctor's appointment, and all the rest of it, we just can't get that. Well, uh, you know what? It's, it's like one story after another, one excuse after another. I mean, we're... We are in dire straits over here. They've got no money for social housing, no money for this, no money for that. Now, I understand that Ukraine is in a war with Russia, but for God's sakes, we have to look after here. 
before we go anywhere else. I, I mean, we can't be giving money willy-nilly uh, around the uh, – we, we need some serious, serious uh, – problems solved here. Yeah, it's, it is about reform, though, as well as money, though. But you make a really, really good point. And Ukraine is actually very germane to the next conversation, because we're going to talk now, actually, first of all, thank you for your call, uh, Paul, but uh, the Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, has died in prison, sparking outrage and suspicion over his politically charged 19-year sentence. Now, Navalny was a vocal critic of Putin. He was moved to a harsh Arctic prison last year, it seemed to be the harshest prison in all of Russia and Siberia, actually. His sudden death after falling ill during a walk raises many questions about his treatment and the circumstances surrounding his death. Well, joining me now to discuss this is uh, the foreign affairs commentator Mary Dajewski is with me, as is the former military uh, uh, intelligence officer Philip Ingram. Thank you both very much indeed for joining me. Mary, I can start with you first. This is this strikes me, you know much more about this than I do, but I mean, uh, Navalny's wife, Yulia, was at the Munich Security Conference today. It, it seems like an awfully big coincidence that Navalny drops dead today of all days. What do you make of this, Mary? Well, I think there are there are a lot of days which could be seen as being sort of um, symbolic in a way um, for um, Navalny's death, um, and each one of them could be seen as making a political point. Um, we've had people on social media um, since the announcement as saying, um, not by chance that this came after Tucker Carlson's interview with Putin. Um, he he had to wait until then to do the deed. Um, we've had other people saying that um, there was, as it were, a conspiracy inside the prison and that it was um, the prison guards that did it. Um, I, you know, I simply don't know. And what I think you can see from, from, from the report so far is that the, the Russian officials were very, very concerned to get the news out in an official way, um, because they obviously realized that there was going to be a lot of um, speculation and rumor, and um, they put their version of it out first. Um, but of course, that hasn't um, prevented all the speculation. Yeah. The Munich Security Conference um, connection, I find that um, slightly less plausible, even though um, Navalny's wife um, was there. Because, um, yes, it's a big event in the security calendar. Um, you can see it. It's also where, um, memorably, um, Putin made um, the speech where he attacked NATO expansion in, I think, um, 2007. Um, but it doesn't seem to me to be a really big event in the international calendar Interesting. that would Interesting. really um, be a, a bit be a symbolic connection for this particular um, this particular really I mean very sad even tragic event. Mm. Philip, what do you make of this? Well, I find it fascinating. You know, the last um, Russian presidential election. Back in 2018, exactly 10 days beforehand was when Sergei Skripal was poisoned in Salisbury. Um, Vladimir Putin's got a, a history of making uh, big statements to send messages to people uh, just before his election. And we're exactly one month before uh, Vladimir Putin's next presidential election and his main opposition leader drops dead in prison. Now, Navalny is not a particularly well man after um, being poisoned with Novichok in 2020. Um, but there was always uh, pressure on um, him to be silenced even more. And since his move to uh, the the prison where he's he's died in, he had put some statements out across social media that I think embarrassed Putin. So I see this as probable um, uh, assassination, but there, you, there isn't enough information at the moment. But it's sending a clear message to anyone in the opposition that opposition will not be tolerated. Let's talk and about the Munich, security, the Munich Security Conference is quite an important, a very important international security conference. Yeah. So I wouldn't completely write off the link between Navalny's wife talking at that and, uh, and this happening today. Mary, just briefly, what's the reaction going to be in Russia? How uh, free are people going to be to express their opinion on this? 
Well, I think there's going to be very little freedom to express an opinion, um, but I think those who are um, relatively um, uh, less concerned about that are going to be on um, sections of social media. But I think there will be a lot of people inside Russia who were part of Navalny's network of campaigners and activists, particularly against grassroots corruption, who are going to, they're going to be mourning quite quietly, mm. um, but they'll also still be there to bide their time. There'll be a lot of clamor in the West, but I think there will be, um, the, 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 there will be um, people who were part of Navalny's team all over Russia, who will be um, distressed, but in a way also resigned at this news, but in a way geared up also to revive those activities once the circumstances that are currently stopping them maybe change. Mary Dujewski and Philip Ingram, thank you both very, very much indeed. Fascinating to hear from you both with your great expertise on this issue. Well, coming up after the break, Prince Harry has break it, broken his silence on King Charles's cancer uh, on Good Morning America. You can find out more on what he had to say next. I'm Peter Cardwell, sitting in for Ian Collins. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. <laughs> King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and bagged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, is it? It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you have to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. up for? This is Plank of the Week, <laughs> Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is, Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, mm -hmm. in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And yeah. that's because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now, that can't be right, mm -hmm. can it? Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Well, in a bombshell interview with Good Morning America, Prince Harry has revealed he's considered applying for United States citizenship. The Duke says he's loving his new life in America so much that he may even take the test for the green card. 
Uh, <laughs> do I feel American? Um, no, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I feel. Would you I, think about becoming a citizen? <sighs> it's, I have I have considered it. Yeah. 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 What would What would stop you from doing it? I have no idea. I, that's, I'm I'm here standing next to this with these guys. Yeah. And this, the American citizenship is <laughs> is a, is a thought that has crossed my mind, but certainly not something that's a high priority for me right now. Well, Talk TV's royal correspondent Rupert Bell joins me now. Uh, Rupert, fascinating that the symbol of Britain, a member of the royal family, although not a working royal, of course, anymore, is thinking of becoming an American, or at least the thought has crossed his mind. I wonder how seriously he's taking it, Rupert. What's your assessment of that? I, I think he's, it, it probably has crossed his mind, but I wouldn't think it's a, a top priority. Um, but it does show you where his mind is and that his new life is in America. And as he's also indicated in this interview, that his family is in America. Well, it's a pretty small family because it's him, his wife and two children because uh, everyone seems to be estranged from their respective families. So it's a very small unit that is his family mm. now in America. But yes, he's come over and he's seen Charles and he didn't say any more that, than what was a, the very much didn't reveal anything about his father's condition, but obviously said he was pleased to find the time to go and see him. And he says he will, uh, on his visits to the UK and maybe around Europe, he will pop in from time to time. But it does seem to indicate that uh, the bridge between the families is still a pretty big one. And he did what any son would want to do and see his father. But it's useful because it highlights his royal connections and this appearance in, in the Invictus Games, I have to, uh, and the sort of drumming up support for it, is what he's good at. You know, hurtling down a, a, a skeleton run uh, requires a certain degree of courage, and he's pretty fearless, as we know. So it was all good um, PR for the Invictus Games. So you can't knock it. You can see why he's done this interview as well, because it's to draw and focus on the Invis Invictus Games. But inevitably, there's always going to be spotlight on him and Meghan, and uh, uh, all the talk of what's going on behind the scenes and what's the subplot to it all and where is it going to lead with Sussex.com and everything. Yeah, it's interesting. So there's been a, a lot of focus on it, but ultimately we want it to make money for Invictus Games, which I have nothing but admiration for the participants in particular. Yes, I wonder as part of that whether uh, Harry will be using the words of W.E. Henley in, Invicta, in the Invictus, the poem saying, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Certainly his own uh, determination in regard to his own position has been very interesting and especially in his relationship with his family. That's something else he was asked about in the Good Morning America interview. Let's have a look at this. I love, I love my family. The fact that I was, have, the fact that I was able to get on a plane and go and see him and spend any time with him, I'm grateful for that. I've also found in, in my own life that um, sort of a, an illness in the family can have a galvanizing or sort of reunifying effect for a family. Absolutely. Is that possible in this case? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you know, I've, uh, throughout all these families, I see it on a on a day to day basis. Um, you know, the, again, the the strength of the, of the family unit coming together. I think any illness, any sickness brings brings families together. He was sort of trying there, Rupert, perhaps not to go into too much detail and perhaps a little bit reluctant to answer that question. I wonder if that is because of the pressure he's been under or just because he knew it was coming and actually uh, maybe it, we had to say something. He had to say something, and you wouldn't have expected him to say anything else. But when you just look at it, you think if he loves his family so much, perhaps he shouldn't be attacking them the whole time. But it's natural that he wants to see his father. Interesting, the person doing the interview is William Reeve, who is the son of Christopher Reeve, lost his mother at a relatively young age. I think she was only 44 when she died. And, of course, his father uh, was paralysed in a riding accident, uh, the former Superman accident. So you could understand where he was interviewing from personal experience but where the answer is he was quickly then to talk about the other members the invictus family and and the soldiers and yeah, he deflected there quickly didn't he Rupert? He, he did deflect it quickly but that was that was noticeable um because i'm sure that there is not much love loss between him and the rest of the family and they don't want to see him at the moment it, it's as simple as that there may be one or two members who still are trying to keep the doors open and it would be perfectly normal, his father and his son, any time, even if there is frosty relations being between them, it is quite right that Harry wants to see his father. But there's still an overriding suspicion that everything is being done for their gain. And until 
they really can sit around and, and build the trust again between them. It, you know, the love is a, a very frosty one at the moment, a bit like the conditions in Whistler. <laughs> That's a very, very good point, Rupert. Well, he's doing a good thing with the Invictus Games. We can absolutely agree on that. And, uh, yeah, it's very, very interesting, actually, in terms of the visit that he had over here. It was only about 30 minutes or so, but, of course, uh, maybe that's on medical orders. Maybe, you know, we've all visited people in hospital and been told, actually, they can only really stand sort of 30 minutes. I've been in hospital, and it is exhausting sometimes having people uh, chatting to you for that length of time. But, actually, he gave very, very little away, and he's been criticised for giving too much away in so many ways and spare on his uh, podcast and so on but actually maybe uh, he's decided that discretion is the better part of valor rupert well and, and that's what i think the royal family in this country want to see that he's not a blabbermouth and not going to spill uh, every as soon as he gets away from the the, the royal family uh, uh, sort of cushion or cocoon as it were that he's going to talk to the next person who's available so i think they want to see the trust because it's the king's decision what he reveals with regard to his illness. And the fact that he said he's cancer is unusual uh, for the royal family to be as open as he has been. So it's not in his uh, behest to actually go out and tell people what is wrong with his father. So at least he's realised that. And I don't know how much he knows about uh, Kate's condition, but again, probably not a lot because they would be worried about him spilling the beans. So this may be a baby step into building trust because no one's going to decry him the efforts that he puts in to the Invictus Games. But ultimately, we've seen the website trying to distance himself from that he's not part of the royal family. But as you come except, back... Except when, Sussex, when it suits him, Rupert. Except when it suits him. Except that, that website, uh, you know, using the Sussex title. I mean, many people will say that's a breach of what he agreed with the Queen. Yeah, yes, and the, using the coats of arms is a, a classic example. You know, if you don't want to be part of it, and in this interview with William Reed for Good Morning America, there he is saying, my family's in the States. And as we began this interview, alluding to the fact that some states he may become an American citizen. So an American, well, they don't believe in titles. Does that mean if he did become an American citizen? Yeah. Would he have to uh, renounce his title? Because they don't tend to have dukes yeah. and dukes and uh, duchesses in America, as far as very, I can see. Very, very big um, question. So I don't that know will... Yeah, very big question that will remain. Thank you, Rupert, and thanks to everybody who's contributed to the show. Really appreciate you. Thank you for everything. I'm Peter Cardwell. I'm back at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. See you then. Thank you very much indeed. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed that if they do no. turn then no. you can be no. in trouble i've got a cockapoo no. if that cockapoo turns on me i win the battle i don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown this concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the you know the corner of the street or whatever i think it's a nonsense <laughs> King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and bagged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry gonna sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way, couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham, just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit?